The title of today's message is Solving a Long Division Problem. <laughs> Solving a Long Division Problem, which is not what you were expecting when you woke up and you came to church this morning, was it? But I've got my trusty whiteboard here, so we're all going to do this together. It'll be okay. I know some of you are having like flashbacks to school, and it's all good. No. We're in the middle of a series called Living the Story, and we've been reading from the book of Ephesians. And um, one of the premises of this uh, series, especially for those of you who are coming in and you haven't been with us for the rest of the series, one of the premises is that you could look at the scriptures as a list of rules, you could look at the scriptures, the Bible, as a manual. You could look at the scriptures as a list of things that you need to do. And you could look at it that way. But you could also look at it, if you were to zoom out, not any one particular book, but just zoom out of the whole thing, you could look at it as something like a story. Something like a story with a beginning and an end and a climax and a problem that's being worked out through the entire story. And if, in fact, you look at it that way, there is a great power and beauty in that. So we've been talking about this whole story. And Paul, in the book of Ephesians, he's drawing out elements of the story and just teaching the Christians in Ephesus about it. And so there's a great, there's a great power in that, into knowing the story, getting the story in you, so that you can actually help live out the story. Because this story is a little different. It's not a story that's just out there, but it actually, you, you're in the story. Even right now, you're in the story. And so we had a couple lessons where we talked about uh, living in the age to come. And that's not terminology that we use a whole lot, but it's very biblical terminology, and there's something for us to learn from there. We talked about living in the age to come and bringing the future into the present. I even named one of the messages, Living in the Future. And when I told you guys we were in the future, I noticed that some of you looked at me with blank looks, and then others of you just were kind of like confused and like, no, I don't even understand what you're talking about. But I actually found proof this week that we are indeed living in the future, and I wanted to show it to you. So you guys know Amazon has like two-day delivery, right? But they're working on making it like one day or I don't know, maybe like one hour. And pretty soon, you know, it's going to be like right before you think about ordering something, it shows up at your door. <laughs> but I want to just show you what, what's the latest in the world going on. So can you show that clip for us? So apparently that's a thing now. I asked Kurt Niergaard, who works for Amazon, I was like, Kurt, I saw this video. I'm kind of freaking out. Is this, is this real? He's like, no, no, it's not real. But I was looking, he looked like he was maybe looking around him a little bit just to see who was listening. <laughs> and there was nobody there, but you know, we were looking around and then what came out of the sky next was, well, it looked like lanterns, but we figured out what it was, was actually drones that were circling above where we were talking. This sounds like I'm making it up, right? This is actual, in fact, what happened. So anyway, that's my proof. We are, in fact, in the future. We'll move on from there. But the title of today's lesson is Solving a Long Division Problem. And when we're talking about division today, we're not talking about the opposite of multiplication, but we're talking about division as in strife, as in conflict, as in tension, as in disunity and disintegration. And we're talking about hostility. And when you talk about that, you know, that's something that has been around, well, if you think about it, it's been around since God approached Adam and called him to account, and Adam turned and said, oh no, that was the woman. And then God addressed the woman and she said, oh no, that was the snake. You remember that? And then their progeny, Cain and Abel, uh, there's a conflict there, and Cain is filled with resentment, and God tries to turn his heart and turn his mind, but, but Cain doesn't make the turn, and he in fact strikes down his brother in a field. And ever since then, you read about what happened in that family and the family that came from that family and it, all the way out to the societal level, and it's just one chapter after another of, of strife, of disunity, of hostility, of violence. And even all throughout history, it's person against person, brother against brother, village against village, nation against nation. 
throughout all of the story and throughout all of history. Unfortunately for us in 21st century United States, with our unprecedented level of connectedness and communication, we have solved the disunity problem. <laughs> okay, I was really hoping you would laugh at that. That tells me that you're listening and you're paying attention. No, we have not. No, we, we haven't solved it. And in fact, for probably everybody in here, I could talk to you, and if I talked to you for a few enough minutes, there'd be some relationship or some circle of relationships in your life, maybe it's your family, with an unreconciled relationship or problem. Maybe it's somebody at work that just drives you crazy or seems to be working always at cross purposes to what you're trying to do. Maybe it's somebody in this room that just makes your blood boil and you see them across the way and you're like, I'm just gonna stay away from that person as long as I can. Maybe it's somebody at your school who doesn't hesitate to pick on you. Or maybe they don't even know they're picking on you. That's how little they think of you. But everybody can probably address some point of tension, conflict, disunity, disintegration. And really the way the scriptures talk about this is it's not like it's just, you know, something that you experience, but it really even talks in terms of there's actually forces of hostility and conflict at work. And perhaps that's not something we think about in those terms very often, but, but that is the way that it's spoken of. And so we talked in this uh, series so far that this is a book, Ephesians, that's written to uh, at least people in Ephesus. That there's thoughts that this letter also circulated to other churches in that same area. But Ephesus is right here, and uh, we, modern day Turkey, roughly speaking, Asia at the time. And we talked about how it was an interesting place because it was in between a, a center of culture of the West and a center of culture of the East. You've got Greek philosophers, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, and then you've got, you know, the Hebrews, the Jews, take Moses in the burning bush. You've got people who would never eat pork in their life. You've got people who, they're like, fine, bring on the pork rinds. We talk about those cultural differences. And I'm making a little bit of light, but only to point out that there was real cultural differences. And then some of these people uh, became Christians from both of those cultures and both of those camps, and then had to figure out how do we coexist and do this together when we've never had to coexist and do this together. So you want to talk about some barriers and some hostility um, that's what you are talking about here. And what I want to do now is I want to read you a passage from Ephesians 2. Um, you can read along either in your Bible or on the screen here, either way. We're going to read 11 verses, chap chapter 2 in Ephesians, verse 12 through 22. And Paul's writing to some of the Christians. He's particularly focusing in this passage on Christians that became Christians that were not of the Jewish faith beforehand. So he's primarily talking to Gentiles, and he's telling them, hey, you guys used to be kind of outside what God was doing and outside of the covenant and all that, but now things are very different and you've been brought in. So that's kind of the context for the whole passage, but let's go ahead and read it together. At that time, you were without the Messiah, excluded from citizenship of Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are far away have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. For he is our peace who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. In his flesh he made of no effect the law, consisting of commands and expressed in regulations, so that he might create in himself one new man from the two, resulting in peace. He did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross and put the hostility to death by it. When the Messiah came, he proclaimed the good news of peace to you who are far away, that's speaking to Gentiles, and peace to those who are near, that's speaking to Jews. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. The whole building being put together by him grows into a holy sanctuary in the Lord. You also are being built together for God's dwelling in the spirit. And again, that's from Ephesians 2. I know last week I had Galatians down here. That was just a test for you guys. A few of you passed it. Good job on catching that typo. Thank you. But this passage is incredible because, once more, it talks about, through Jesus, this dividing wall of hostility that was a real thing was demolished. And 
That's a very deep statement. And he's saying, now you guys are experiencing the fruits of that, you Jews and Gentiles. And he's really actually talking about more than just the Jew-Gentile barrier. He's talking about barriers between humankind in general, all the barriers. But the one that was most obvious and immediate and pressing and difficult was the one between Jews and Gentiles. So if Jesus destroyed that barrier, then he also destroyed all other such barriers. Do you follow what I'm saying? They're saying Jesus has destroyed them. Jesus has destroyed those barriers those barriers. This is part of the story. And I mentioned this scripture earlier in the series, but I want to go back to it. Ephesians 1.10, it also talks about bringing together, but it's not talking about um, simply people and people groups. In this case, it's a bit broader, and I'm going to chop off the middle because it's a very long, long sentence, and I just want to highlight one part of it right now, but you can go back and read it later at your leisure. But in Ephesians 1 verse 10, it says, to bring everything, this is God's purpose, to bring everything together in the Messiah, that's Jesus, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. And that's fascinating because he's broadening what Jesus is bringing together to not just Jew and Gentile, not even just people groups, but what do you see here? What is God bringing together in Jesus? All things in heaven and on earth, which if you think about it, it's pretty much all things, right? All things in heaven and on earth is brought together, is being brought together under Jesus. That's all things. This is very broad. And it's not exactly something that I think about all all the time, but I want to present it to you. And as I was thinking about it more this week, I was thinking about, okay, so there's a story, and Jesus uh, is bringing things together in this story. And so I went went to the, the end of the story, and I just wanted to look at some of what's going on at the end of the story. And if I, if I tell you that this is God's story and God's story with man, what would you say is the end of the story as it is written in our form? You might say Revelation, right? Like the last book. And you might say even the end of Revelation. So I'm gonna look at a couple of scriptures with you from Revelation in 21 and 22 and see what we see there because I think it's, it's worth seeing. It's very fascinating. So this is from Revelation 21, uh, I believe it's verses 1 and 2. You can again read in your, scripture, your Bible in front of you or read here with us. But the writer says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea no longer existed. I also saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. And so here in this passage, you have mentioned a new heaven and a new earth. Now, if I mentioned seeing a heaven and an earth, where in the scriptures does that bring your mind back to? I think where, what does that call back to? What does that remind you of? Probably makes you think primarily of the beginning of Genesis, right? Where God creates heaven and earth. And this is where it's so interesting because we've even mentioned in this series that in the Bible, um, these heaven and earth are, they go together quite often. I just did a search this morning on Bible Gateway and there's well over a hundred scriptures that talk about heaven and earth. These things go together, they're partners. And, you know, I asked, I asked everybody that was in the Kids Quest group this morning where I did a short version of this lesson for before they went and served the kids. Um, I asked them, when you, when you think of heavens and earth, um, and you think of a city coming down from heaven to earth. Now, granted, when we talk about these things, I have to confess, we're reaching for something, right? We're reaching for something we don't have a full comprehension of. I'm reaching for something I don't have a full comprehension of. So we got to give ourselves plenty of room to give grace and think here, you know, as, as openly as we can. But when you think about a city coming down from heaven to earth, do you think that would work right now? Do you think we would be ready for a city coming down from heaven to earth? Do you think we're ready for that? Probably not what you woke up thinking about this morning, granted. I understand that. But we talk about in this series that part of where we're at in the story is God wants us to bring the future, so to speak, into the present. And he wants us to help him in his project of reclaiming the earth, which is rightfully his, for him. And so we're working to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth, to make earth look more like what? Heaven. And so, if you think about that, then perhaps there is a time, perhaps there is a time when earth could be ready. 
And we talked about this. And we, we, it's something that, you know, it might stretch your brain a little bit to think about, and that's okay. Uh, that's not a bad thing. But we even talked about Jesus when he went to the cross and he was resurrected and then he ascended to the right hand of his father, right? That's the core of the gospel right there. Um, that Jesus had this amazing ability to do something that I don't really see other people in the scriptures doing, which is he could come be right here at home on earth, right? Eating fish and eating bread and talking to his disciples, saying, touch my hands. But then like he would also, he could be in heaven. He could be in heaven and earth at the same, you know, he, in his body. And then we talked about how Jesus is clearly in the scriptures. He's said to be the first fruits, meaning he's a harbinger, a sign of what is to come with everybody else. Meaning like if you want to see what God's trying to do in the world, look at Jesus and see what he's already done with Jesus. And that which he's already done with Jesus, he's looking to do with you and with all of us. So that's a little bit of a tangent. We can't go all the way down that rabbit hole today, but just think about it. But the bottom line is when you read the scripture, new heavens and new earth, it does conjure this image of, of the creation, right? The very beginning of the story. So now let's go to Revelation 22. Verse, uh, I think it's one through five in chapter 22 of Revelation. Then he showed me the river of living water, sparkling like crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the broad street of the city. The tree of life was on both sides of the river, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for healing the nations, and there will no longer be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his slaves will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Night will no longer exist, and people will not need lamplight or sunlight, because the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. So another picture is being painted here, and I just want us to think about some of the elements that are in this passage. So for one, God is providing light. Did you catch that? God is providing light. The people, humankind, are reigning and ruling. The people, humankind, are existing in unbroken intimacy, fellowship, and connection with God. You see a river. You see a tree of life. And you have the curse being undone and reversed. So when you look at all of those elements and the picture that it paints, what is that drawing your attention back to? If you've read it, those images should make you think, I think, of Genesis 1 and 2, the beginning of the story. God providing light, people reigning and ruling, God an unbroken connection with his people, a uh, river, a tree of life. When's the last time you saw the tree of life? You know, that's, that's something. Um, and reversing the curse that happened where? Right there in the garden. And so what I'm saying is, if we're looking at the story, and we're looking at the end of the story, and it's making you think of the beginning of the story, well, that's something. And so we've talked about this before, but if you were to draw a simple diagram for the beginning of the story, it's God creates heaven and earth. I'm just, that's, you know, a shorthand you could say for creation. And at the end of the story, it's extremely symmetrical, right? There's, the end looks quite a bit like the beginning. And so I'm just trying to paint a very broad brush, like 30,000 foot view, that this is the story. And we've talked about in the past how some of the chapters in that story unfold. So very early on in the story, you have something that happens, right? A problem. People decide to disobey and rebel against God and go a different way. And something happens there. And I'm just representing this with, instead of heaven and earth being like two things working together, there's, there's some kind of split that's introduced into reality. And man can no longer live in unbroken connection with God in and of himself. But then there's this rescue mission, this thing that God's always on the path. And he tells the people, hey, create a tabernacle for me and I'll make my dwelling there. I, I still want to be with you guys. I still want to make this relationship work, even though you've messed it up. And so this is my, my great version of a tabernacle or a temple. If you were wondering what that is, it's not an angry crying cat or something like that. It's a tabernacle or a temple 
But in one sense, you could think of it as like, hey, God's trying to establish an outpost of heaven on earth here so he can be with people. Remember we talked about God with us. God's always trying to find a way and is finding a way to be with us. And so that was true for quite a bit of time. But then as you keep going in the chapters, you see Jesus introduced on the scene. And it says, Jesus made his dwelling with us. Or you could actually translate that, Jesus tabernacled with us. Jesus said, destroy this temple and it'll be rebuilt in three days. And so no longer was it simply the temple or the tabernacle, but it was actually Jesus himself where heaven and earth overlapped. And particularly in the events of the cross and the resurrection, we'll talk about that more. But if we go to the next chapter, this is where it gets really interesting and this is where you come in. Because after Jesus' death and resurrection, it becomes clear that God's spirit is no longer relegated and mobilized to the tabernacle. And I'm not saying anything could actually contain God's spirit, but in a manner of speaking, that something changed. And God said, I will actually put my spirit in each person that decides to follow Jesus. And this was a promise that had been given for, for centuries. And so they were waiting for this spirit. But the spirit, you know, it Tongues of fire were on people's heads. That was a clear marker that God is doing this in the same way that back in the day, you know, fire would come shooting out of the tabernacle or the temple to show that God's presence is here. A cloud of the Lord, you know, something that was a bit nebulous but clearly representing God's marker. And then you have the spirit, something that you can't see, but it's clearly a marker of God's presence. And so now God's spirit and God's work has gone highly mobile with every individual. And so I represent that with little, you know, stick figures. This is, this is like you and me. And then we've got the end here. And so, again, what I'm trying to do is just show you there's, there's a big sweeping picture here of the story, of the story that we're in. And I know I've already been kind of working overtime in the series, and I, I gave you another diagram that we talked about the present age and the age to come. And just to convince you, I'm not like just trying to throw terminology at you that these two things actually work together. Um, I want to just kind of map this out a bit, right? So we talked about the present age and the age to come. And I knew I wouldn't be able to write it all while I was talking, so I wrote it ahead of time. Don't, you know, don't, don't try to take this as exact or anything like that, but just, just listen, you know, kind of with an open mind. But there was always the present age, it was understood, right? And then there was to come, the age to come, where God was going to come, God was going to become king, God was going to make things right. Uh, only when Jesus came, it became clear at a certain point that it wasn't like an all at once thing, like today is judgment day and it's all over and sin is just totally removed from the world. It wasn't that, but that that was still in the plan. We talked about the age to come having an initial moment with Jesus and the cross and the resurrection and a time of fulfillment. But this is where you and I come in because we're in this really interesting time. We said it's in the meantime, the in-between time. We use the phrase already and not yet. And in fact, you have been called upon by the Lord to help further his rescue mission. That's the best, most important, most noble mission you will ever be invited into. And he asks you, in following Jesus, to do what Jesus did, to work for the kingdom of God to come, for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the crucial moment without question, the climax, the linchpin, the turning point of this story is with Jesus. And I think we know and we sense that, but it's worth thinking about. When Jesus went to the cross, when Jesus went to the cross, we, we say, most often, more often than not, we just say, well, Jesus went to the cross for me. And guess what? Jesus did go to the cross for you. But there's also more to the story. We want to broaden that. Because when Jesus went to the cross, he, in doing so, confronted 
sin. He confronted idolatry. He confronted hostility. And in him confronting those, and in his obedience and submission and fulfillment of what God had always wanted, in that, he was raised and he defeated those forces. He defeated sin and idolatry and hostility. And not only did he defeat them, but he conquered their consequences. Death. Hostility. Disconnection between God and man. He defeated those forces, those enemies. He confronted them head on. He defeated them, and he defeated their consequences. This is really important in the gospel. And because he defeated them, because of his submission and his obedience and his fulfillment of God's will and his confrontation and his defeat, God raised him, the Father raised him, and he is now reigning because he won. Do you get that? He won. Now, it may not look like it. That's a big thing, right? It may not look like it, but that's what we've talked about. As Paul's writing to the Ephesians, he's like, look, you got to understand, you're in the in-between time. You're in the meantime. You're in the already but not yet. But you are part of the working out of that victory, person by person and situation by situation. But the cross was the center. And the cross was to bring everybody together. Not just like this. Not just like, Hey, I know we all have our preferences, but can everybody just agree on vanilla ice cream? Not like that. Not like can't we all just agree on Jesus? That's not, he broke a force down. That's different. You see, he did something. That may not be the most obvious thing to you and me. It's not necessarily the way that we think, but understand in the story, that's what Jesus did. And it's, even though he did that, here's the encouraging thing. Maybe you're, maybe you're like, this is way up there. Okay, but, but understand, it's not like the fact that he did that was immediately obvious to everybody. And it's not like the fact that he did that told everybody immediately in an obvious way what they needed to do. Because there were still Jews and Gentiles uh, not really figuring out how to get along. You follow me? There were still people like some of the Jewish Christians were not even really thinking to reach out to all the Gentiles for a while. I mean, they did eventually, but some of it came through things like this, like the letter of Ephesians and somebody pointing out like, hey, let's sit back and look at the story. What does the story say? The story says Jesus broke down the dividing wall of hostility. So let's do this. And you've got people like Paul writing the letter to the Ephesians. And I think the same applies to us now, encouraging and exhorting like, look, please open your mind, open your heart to see how big what God has done is. Can you open? You're going to need supernatural help to even understand this, which is fitting. Because then he says, the supernatural powers are looking and watching, and they're like, oh my goodness. Is that what God, how did that, is that going to work? Like, no way. And God's like, yeah, <laughs> it is going to work. And it says, us doing that is exhibit A of God's wisdom and power. Us doing, do you hear that? Us doing that is exhibit A to the world and even to beings that we don't even know or see of God's wisdom and power. That's the story. And it's important. It's important. Jesus had been made king. He was to be, he is to be the unifying thing that Jews and Gentiles can overcome dividing walls of hostility. Things in heaven and things on earth can overcome the divisions and be brought together. Jesus 
is the one under whom that can and will be done. And he says, as you do that, as you join to Jesus, guess what? I'll do the rest. I'll join you guys to each other. He uses analogies like, hey, I'll build you into a building together. He says, I'll do that. He says, I'll build you into a body together. As you unite to Jesus, I'll do the rest, and I'll unite you guys to each other. We could come up with our own analogies, but those are just some of the analogies he used. And God will do that. And so when it comes to division, when it comes to unity, we got to understand, like, it's not just like, a checklist item on God's agenda, right? It's not just a thing to do. It's not just like, oh, that would be nice. Um, It's not like be a goody two-shoes and just do the right. It's so much more than that in what God is doing and has done and is trying to do now. And I think we got to understand that going into the future, it's important. We are going into the future. I, I showed you the Amazon thing, right? Well, there was another little incident this week. It was one week ago today that really convinced me, like, man, we're in the future. I got to tell you this, just to, like, give you a chance to breathe a little bit right now. But So I was at Chipotle, like I do, and I was just having fun eating Chipotle. And... Um, I was, saw this family, they were sitting at a big table and they were enjoying their meal together. And then I was listening to the music, you know, the music comes on in a restaurant, you're just kind of like semi-aware of it. And then I was listening to the music and I was like, what? You know, I heard this. And I do not know what's happened, but my head was kind of going a little bit. And then I realized like, wait a second. The words came on. I was like, they are playing. Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre? (laughs) Nothing but a G tag? (laughs) And then there was like a nine month old baby that was on her dad's shoulders and she was going like this. (laughs) I'm not kidding. I was like, man, if you had talked to me like 1993 and said, listen, in 26 years, you're gonna be at a Chipotle I'm like, first of all, what's Chipotle? (laughs) It sounds delicious. And do I need to invest? (laughs) And they're going to be playing that song in Chipotle when a baby's going to be dancing to it. I mean, I would just be like, no way. That's that's impossible. Like, can you, I just imagine myself at my age now, like, in my day, we had great musicians. Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre. (laughs) Not like this music now. All right, that story is apropos of nothing other than we are going into the future. (laughs) But I had to share it. So I just want to do a side-by-side comparison with you. And I brought up this diagram. Um, I guess we lost diagrams. Do we have anything? There we go. Um, I brought up this diagram earlier in this series. And um, I just mentioned that culturally, I think what we've inherited is sort of like the simplest version of the gospel that, that kind of resonates and we have strong images that go with it. It's kind of like a storyline with me. This is, the, this is one version of a frame of the gospel. Me, it's about me and my life, and then at the end, you know, it's heaven or hell. And I want to affirm that all these elements are very relevant to the story and important and real, but what I, I ask you to do is question, is that the only or even the best or even the most thorough biblical framing of the gospel, okay? And so, so, Again, that's an oversimplification. Almost everything is, but just for what it's worth. And then, but, but look at what we're talking about today. Do you, do you see there's a, there's a contrast here? Do you see that there's a, a different, there are different points of emphases? And I think they're important. I think we at least need to be able to learn both languages at a minimum, right? And, and be able to expose ourselves to like, you know, why was the gospel so powerful in the first century? I'm I'm very interested in that question. Like, what was it that people, it, they just got it and they're like, I am motivated. You know what I mean? Like, I am motivated, whether somebody's watching me or not, whether someone's asking me or not, what's gonna drive you? And I ask you that. You know, what is going to drive you? There's this uh, apocryphal story, I think it's more like a parable, but um, there's people laying bricks. I heard this a week ago or so. There's people laying bricks and Someone comes along and asks the first person, I see you laying bricks. 
uh, what are you doing? He says, I'm laying bricks. And then he goes on to the next person. He's, the person who's also laying bricks says, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm, I'm building a wall, can't you see? And then he goes on to the next person, the third person. He says, what are you doing? He says, well, we're building a cathedral. And the point is, like, why are we here? What are we here doing? Why are you here? What's motivating you? What is going to motivate you? What's your motivation for fighting for righteousness and purity and holiness? What's your, what's your motivation for that? How good is your motivation? How strong is it? What's your motivation or what's your context for reaching out to people and inviting them in? How strong is it? How much is it? It's just something for you to reflect on. I want to ask you, what's your motivation and how much is it specifically for what we're talking about today, for fighting for unity and integration? What is it? Because to me, there can be a big difference. Let's say you're talking about, you know, something that's, something where strong opinions come in, like politics, social media posts, social media arguments on Facebook or wherever, or even things in the church that people just tend to have strong agreements about. And one way of looking at that, and you're thinking like, oh man, should I, should I do this? How should I respond? Should I respond? What should I say? Should I say this? Is that bad? Is that wrong? Like, is that a sin? Is that a bad sin? If you're just thinking in terms of, you know, something like this, that's a very simple version. If you're thinking about something like that, you might think, well, it's not really a, a sin. It's not wrong. It's at least as right as what this person said. And, you know, plus they were also wrong of what they said. So shouldn't I be the one to like correct them and show them the error of their ways? And I don't think it's really a sin. It's definitely not as bad as what you get caught in these. That's your conversation versus this. I am part of a millennia-long story in which God has been at work to bring all things together under heaven that is in Christ, who, in perfect obedience, submission, patience, love, and fulfilling the will of his Father, put it all on the line to defeat the forces of hostility and the barriers. And I will write the next chapter in that story with my life. That's a story-shaped life. And do you hear how it's different? And when you go to reach out to somebody, there's so many ways you can do it. I've done it different ways. Many of them I'm embarrassed about, to be quite honest with you. But for many people, I've said, look, Hey, let's sit down and as quickly as I can, let me show you the error of your ways and the trajectory that you're on because it's bad, buddy, and I want to be the one to tell you immediately with no context. That's one way. <laughs> or you can say, look, I got to tell you the story I think we're in. I'm amazed by it. I want you to see it and be amazed by it. There's going to be some sobering elements like judgment and re self-reflection and repentance. But listen, by the time you get done hearing the whole story, my hope is you're going to be like, of course I want to repent. I can't imagine anything more refreshing, more liberating, more healthful, more wholesome that's wise for my life. Do you see? There's a difference. Or when it comes to something that will make your brother or sister sh stumble and struggle, which is a big biblical theme, like... You could be like, well, I guess I should because it's the right thing to do and I know there's a scripture about it. Or you could be like, yes, that's the least I can do to further the story, to tell the story with my life. If it costs me something and if it's hard, good, all the better, all the better because it will just bring God that much more glory. There is a difference and what I'm saying is I think some frameworks and some motivations will take you farther than others. And so I'm asking you to reflect, and I'm asking you to think about it, and I'm asking you to consider all of this. Why would we not, why would we not want that? I mean, you could have a preacher try to stand up here every week and say all the things that everybody needs to do differently, 
and repeat them ad nauseum and be so amazing and, you know, talented. We don't, probably don't have anybody exactly like that, but to convince you every week of what you need to do. But you can also get the story in you, yourself, you know? And we can help each other with that, but it's a personal thing too. I want to live a story-shaped life. We're going to take communion now, so I'll ask the ushers to prepare that. But I want you to be prepared. I want you to be equipped with the gospel. When I say gospel, I mean the full story of what Jesus did in the context of the full story of the scriptures, the whole story. There is immense, immense power in there, much greater than anything I can say day after day or week after week, or any of us can. And maybe for some of us, you know, it can be a really healthy thing to go through some period of dissatisfaction. You know, like dissatisfaction with something in your life where, like, uh, I'm not satisfied with this. Now, we don't want to become discontent. I'm saying if you go through something where you're dissatisfied a little, like, I know there's something better or something more, that can be a great pivot point. And I just want to ask you, like, if you feel like this hits the mark for you, be willing to go through a little bit of dissatisfaction with, you know, status quo, whatever that means for you, and like, do I need to expand? How do I get this story in me? Because that could be a great trigger for you. When you realize you're dissatisfied, that's also the key to a new hunger, and that's a key to a new habit. And you get a new hunger and you get a new habit, you're talking about changing your life. You're talking about changing your destination and your trajectory for good. That's the best thing I think anybody can give you. That's better than somebody getting up here and giving everybody a million dollars. Not that we have a million dollars to give out, but (laughs) you follow what I'm saying. The core, the linchpin, the climax of this is Jesus going to the cross, dying, resurrecting, and ascending. Every time we take communion together, we we are embodying that. We are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. We do this, it's very physical, it's very real, it's very undeniable. We do this, to recognize Jesus and what he's done and to tell the story right now. Let's pray. Father, we lift up this time, a special time to you. Thank you for bringing us together this morning. Thank you for bringing us together in general. We, we don't even begin to comprehend the vastness of what we're talking about, but we, we want to honor you with everything we do. We want our eyes to be opened. Please help us with that. Uh, we do want to be exhibit A of, of your wisdom and your power and your honor and your glory. We thank you for Jesus. We recognize what he did um, on the cross and confronting sin and idolatry and defeating it as well as death, exile, disconnection, hostility and barriers of all kinds. We honor him now through this in Jesus' name, amen.